We'll go ahead and get started. I'm Holly Brenner, Vice President of Strategic Development and Marketing, and I appreciate you making time this morning for our No and Go Friday session. I'm very excited about this program. I think it's a little different than some of the programs that we've had in the past, but I'm excited because it does, um, does address another one of the eight dimensions of well-being that we talk about through No and Go. So I think it's going to be a great presentation. We do have a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. A number of things on your tables this morning. Of course, your chance to win a door prize, so if you're interested in that, please fill it out and plan to uh, pass that to you right at the end. The yellow comment card, in fact, I think the yellow comment card is how we got the idea for this program, so please continue to fill those out. We take your comments very seriously and try to incorporate your suggestions. We have the know and go for next month. This is going to be an interesting program, too, by Dr. Strong, who is leading this uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. That should be a nice program. And maybe the crown jewel of all the things on your desk, the uh, No and Go mouse pad. So this is a, a thank you appreciation for attending our No and Go session. So um, take that back and use it. All right, so I'll get on with the introduction and our chaplains, or someone, one of the team is going to be doing the uh, reflection. So as I mentioned, this is an addressing one of the other eight dimensions of well-being. And we'll hear today from our, some of our dedicated chaplains. The team is larger than what you'll see up here today, but uh, they are representative of the group. And also, Dr. Colmenares is here representing our providers and how they work together to help and serve our mission. So we'll hear from Dr. Colmenares, who is, of course, our chief medical officer and also a family medicine provider with the Fond du Lac Regional Clinic. And several of our chaplains, including Jess, uh, Jessica Osterhaus, uh, she reminded me, it reminds me of uh, Rhymes with Toaster, Oster, <laughs> Osterhaus, Don Vandenberg, and Amy Baum. So uh, actually, I'm not sure who's coming up. Amy? Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Holly. It's really terrific um, to be able to spend some time with you this morning talking about the ministry that we do and um, helping you come to a greater understanding of spirituality and spiritual care. Holly mentioned that we would begin with a reflection. I have a few words about healing. The word healing comes from the root to make whole to resolve the inner contradictions within a being, and thereby to release its full potential. Wholeness always includes the sacred dimension, and it is at the heart of what it means to be healed. When we invoke the sacred, we participate in a great healing. Healing, wholeness, and hope Words we use a lot here at Agnesian, words that you will hear repeatedly throughout this morning's presentation. Holly mentioned that one of the reasons we've chosen this topic was because of spirituality being a topic on our well-being wheel. When we talk about this wheel, we're talking about leading a meaningful and fulfilling life through conscious behaviors focused upon living at our fullest potential. It's kind of like the Christian scripture, to have life and have it to the full. This way of living is a way of well, living throughout our lives. It's multifaceted, and one of the facets is spirituality. The little green wedge <laughs> up there is spirituality. One of the many, as we depicted here, eight dimensions. Unfortunately, spirituality is kind of often overlooked. A simple way of thinking about it is that, as we describe it up here, is finding life's purpose through shared values and beliefs. But if I was to ask each one of you to write down what you thought spirituality was, and then we were to collect it on the board, it might look something like this. Lots of different meanings for lots of people. For me personally, spirituality is about life. It's about that source that animates me, that grounds me, that helps give me and my life meaning. For our purposes in spiritual care, this is our operating definition. Spirituality is that aspect of humanity that refers to how we seek and express meaning and purpose. It's the way we experience our connectedness to the moment, to the self, to others, 
to the significant or the sacred. It may include religion, but it really is a far more general term. And spirituality can be expressed in a variety of ways. I want to tell you about a little lady I got to visit with on, a, on the floor a couple weeks ago, 90 years old. And uh, she had suffered her second major stroke, leaving her fairly physically debilitated and very unable to speak. We got to talking about what was most important with her daughter. So I got up real close and I said directly to her, what's most important to you? Now here's a woman who can barely speak, but as plain as day, she said, family, living, prayer. She talked about the moment, living. She talked about others, her family, and she talked about the sacred and prayer. A way to think about this is in looking at these interconnected relationships. Here again, we have the sacred, the moment, others, nature, and self. Our spirituality is very interconnected and it's always about relationship. Spirituality is often used as a term interchangeably with the word religion. They are certainly overlapping ideas, but they are not the same thing. To make the distinction, religion is a formal structure through which people express spirituality within a community. It includes common beliefs, attitudes, practices, traditions, and relationships. So I think of religion as a way of organizing our spirituality. Some of us choose to express our spirituality in that way, some of us don't. Whether we, explore spiritu whether we approach spirituality from a secular or faith-based perspective, spirituality is part of the whole of being human and it contributes to living life fully. However, we all know that our wholeness can be stressed, diseased by illness, loss, trauma, all kinds of things. And in these times, spirituality can play a significant role in our healing. So again, think about the 90-year-old that I visited last week. Here she was, very physically debilitated, but very much alive and connected to the moment. Her spirituality was a great part of what animated her. So this is where spiritual care, chaplains uh, in particular, come in in healthcare. For us, spiritual care are interventions, individual, communal, that facilitate how we integrate our body, mind, and spirit, that facilitates our connection to self, others, the sacred, that helps us to achieve health and wholeness. These are just a bunch of words. Words can't fully express what spiritual care is. But story, I think, is the best way for us to get at the fullness of this meaning. In the next few minutes, we're going to hear many, many stories. The identities of the characters in the stories have been changed to protect their confidentiality. But these are stories that are real stories that come from our experiences. And so to further explain and express to you what spiritual care is about here at Ignition, I invite Dr. Colmenares to the podium. Well, thank you, Sister Amy. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, well, thanks for coming today and spending your morning with us. Physicians are trained by using stories. We call them case studies, but they really are patient stories. And what I'd like to do is just share with you a patient's story 
and try to use that to give you the perspective from a physician's point of view on spiritual care. And my story is going to be a story about Anne. Now Anne, Anne, I met her 14 years ago. Um, she was 60 years old. She's older now. Um, back then, she was starting to beginning the beginnings of rheumatoid arthritis, and she was starting to, to feel the effects of her rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is not the osteoarthritis where it just kind of hurts a little bit. This is the arthritis that starts to bend your fingers, they give you nodules, the ones where you get stooped and you can't move and it hurts to grab a glass and to drink, where you have difficulty putting buttons on and zippers. And she was starting to show this and she was also beginning to show the beginnings of sadness, anger, frustration. And the years passed and at our visits, we would try to deal with her pain and we would take her from the simple medicines like Tylenol and some of the stronger pain medicines to some of the things that affect your immune system. But what was becoming more obvious was Anne's behavior. I asked her about support. As any physician does, we ask about support. Your family, your friends, your faith and church. And that's when Anne said, what kind of God would let people suffer like this? She wasn't going to church anymore. And I don't think my attempt really reached her as I tried to help her with that. Um, time went on and her rheumatoid arthritis did progress and her simple tasks, they were not simple anymore. Her personality was now filled with frustration, filled with anger. And I attempted to help her with her physical pain. And we talked about medicines for her mood. You know, they, they weren't helpful. Then, I think things are bad enough, Anne went and unfortunately she suffered a stroke. She came to our hospital. She was cared for by our neurologists, cared for by our hospitalists. She survived, she was discharged to home, and she was here to present for follow-up with me in the office. So here I am reviewing her notes. You know, I reviewed the emergency department notes, I reviewed the neurology notes, the hospitalist notes. They talked about how she got the clock busters. They talked about how she had some residual weakness on top of her rheumatoid arthritis. I skimmed the interdisciplinary and chaplain notes. And I'm standing there at the door now, getting ready to meet Anne. And I was nervous, very nervous. Rheumatoid arthritis, stroke, anger, frustration. It was one of those things where you stand at the door and you breathe in, you ask for help. I knock and I enter. But Anne wasn't herself. Maybe, maybe she was herself. Anne started happily relaying to me the care she received. She started with the emergency department. She started talking about the nurses who came and held her hand. She talked about the emergency room physician who came, sat down, looked at the side that she could see from easily and spoke slowly to her about what was about to happen. Spoke about the care of the neurologist and the hospitals and the nurses on the floor. She was beaming about this, about the care we had given her. I was really taken back, I was shocked. Um, we finished the visit, and at the end of the visit she said to me, Dr. C, I'm going back to church. So here I am thinking, oh my goodness, what, what just happened? So I run back to the, my office and I start going through my notes. And I started reviewing the notes that I had skimmed, the chaplain notes. And there it was, right in front of me, I read the chaplain's notes, it said, we spoke of how rheumatoid arthritis robs one of simple pleasures at times. She then asked me to pray. Tears came at the mention of strength, 
courage, and the ability to realize that her suffering was not without purpose. Her tears intensified at the thought that God loves her no matter what. And he forgives. So I still care for Anne. She's had no miraculous cure in her rheumatoid arthritis. She's not had a miraculous cure in the weakness from her stroke. But our visits are no longer filled with the frustration and anger that she had at one time. Now she talks about her grandkids. She talks about her future. There's a difference. So what is a physician's perspective on spirituality? I just gave you a case study, and I'm going to tell you the importance of this. Physicians are taught the importance of support. We're taught that family, friends, faith, religion all play a role in a person's health. But physicians are like everyone else. We're at different places with our spirituality. What we do know, when we survey patients that are hospitalized, over 40% of them want to talk about spirituality and religious concerns. We also know from our medical research that people who struggle with spirituality have poorer health outcomes, as Anne was having. Most importantly, what Anne's story shows us is the importance of caring for the whole person. I think we know that here. I consider myself blessed to work at Ignatian Healthcare. We know that we need to treat the whole person, and we see this every day. I think Anne's story just confirms that. But sometimes we need help. As a family medicine physician, when I take care of a patient with their heart issue, I can take it so far, but sometimes I have to call in a cardiologist. Sometimes I have to call in an endocrinologist to help me. Now, Anne's spiritual conflict, that required another specialist that we have here, chaplains. I consider our chaplains our spiritual specialists. They are some absolutely amazing people that deal with some of life's most difficult questions. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to some of our chaplains who are gonna tell you some absolutely amazing stories. I will warn you, get out the tissues now. <laughs> um, and with that, Sister Amy, who do we have next? Some kind of introduction that was. <laughs> well, this morning I'm going to briefly talk to you about what is it that a chaplain looks like and where is it that you might find us inside these walls of the hospital and also outside. So I think the million dollar question is, what does a chaplain look like? <laughs> You're like, that must be a mistake, I don't know if she's a chaplain. <laughs> I've walked into several patient rooms and the first response is either verbal or nonverbal. You're the chaplain? Oh, okay. Either they're relieved or despairing. But after we begin talking, they begin to see that chaplains are a lot like themselves. A lot like you guys sitting out there in the audience. We are people filled with flaws, with faith, and we're a lot of fun too, actually. I want to point to this group. This is our team, our spiritual care services team, um, part of Ignatian Healthcare here. And we're quite the eclectic bunch, ranging from the ages of 30 to 74. And I will have you guess which age goes to which picture. We will, we will not disclose that today. I think people tend to have a picture, maybe of a pastor or a chaplain, like an older man wearing a robe or a white collar, someone who's just gonna come there and pray. But there's a lot more that goes with faith and spirituality as Sister Amy touched on. And our spiritual care team is made up of many uh, faith traditions. When we welcome new employees in our orientation, we say we are here to serve people of all faiths and no faiths. And the fact that we have a wide variety of people grounded in different faiths helps to do that as well. Now, many of us do get the comment, well, how can you do this job? It's just filled with so much sadness and hopelessness. 
And honestly, there are days where it is that sad, where it is that hopeless. And when you're with a baby who just died, you do go to thoughts of your own life, your own family. You do look at life differently. But there's also times of so much joy and celebration. And it's also because of working with this team that we can get through it together. There's a lot of common relief here in this room. <laughs> and if you would ever come to our office and peek through the window, I can't promise you what you will or will not see. But I wanted to also um, let you know that we provide 24-7 on-care, um, on-call coverage for the hospitals for admission. So this team makes up that really important um, provision that we give. I want to also highlight the fact what each one of these people do. And if anyone wants to stand up who's here, who's part of our care team. Uh, okay, Kirsten doesn't have to. She's a new mom here in the front. <laughs> she's on maternity leave, but we also want to highlight she's here with us. And also Sister Mary Mollison, uh, Vice President of Spirituality and Care Transitions. She is our fearless leader, and we are so grateful for her. Here we have Dawn Vandenberg. You will find her on the ICU, also in the Behavioral Health Unit, uh, Outpatient Addiction Services, and also on the Ethics Committee. Sister Amy Gohm serves here at St. Agnes Hospital on many different units here. Uh, Reverend Kirsten Rosala Dunkey, and she is fittingly on the Women and Infants Unit, so she's an expert at that, third, third child there in the front. She's also a member of Resolve Through Sharing, helping with uh, infant ch children loss. She's also a member of Inpatient Palliative Care Team here at St. Agnes Hospital. Next, we have me, and I don't like that picture, but anyways, here we are. <laughs> Always look at yourself differently on camera here. I am a member of, I work at the dialysis centers, uh, Dear Madame Fond du Lac in Waupon. I also start my mornings at Waupon Memorial Hospital, and then I come on down the road here at St. Agnes Hospital. Reverend Tracy Wilkinson, she is part of our pastoral care team um, as far as an educator here at the hospital. Then we have Sister Julia Wiggily. She is at the St. Francis Home in Terraces, also works at the Cancer Center and here at St. Agnes Hospital. Then we have Pam Worth. Uh, she is also at St. Francis Home and Terraces, Adult Day Services, and takes on-call coverage at the hospital here as well. And our lonely man in the group, don't feel too sorry for him, Reverend Greg Nuremberg. He is part of our outpatient palliative care team, as well as outpatient hospice. Then we have Karen Krauss. She's at the Hospice Home of Hope. We have Peg Samala. She is at the Ripon Medical Center and also an outpatient hospice and Reverend Laura Hawkins, our outpatient hospice team member as well. And as we talk about chaplains and where we are and where you'll find us, we always like to highlight the fact that we are where life happens, in the mundane, in the mess, in the craziness, in just the ordinary days. And that is also where the spirit continues to show up. Because if we stood up here and didn't talk about that portion of our job, then we wouldn't be telling you the whole picture. And next, I bring up here Dawn. She's going to be talking just a little bit about our backgrounds as chaplains and what that all entails. Hello, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, well, I'm here to tell you a little bit about our educational background. And this may come as a surprise um, to many. It's not uncommon for us to have fielded this question before. Hey, chaplain, now did you go to school for this? Or are you a volunteer? You know what, I believe in Jesus and I like to pray and I'm wondering, can I be a chaplain too? And so we do get asked this. And so this just gives you a little bit of background of what it takes to become, uh, ch uh, to be a chaplain um, the, on a professional level. Okay, so everybody that you just saw on the previous slides um, have either a Master of Divinity or a Master of Theological Studies or the equivalent. Um, some faith communities actually require ordination to become a chaplain and or some form of endorsement. So uh, 
what that looks like. Jessica, for example, in her faith tradition, there isn't a bishop, so her faith community needed to endorse her to actually go along this path. For me, I'm a laywoman Catholic, and of course, women are not ordained in the Catholic Church, so my um, stamp of endorsement needed to come from the bishop. Um, so, but everybody's walk to this is a little bit different. Um, part of our training involves clinical pastoral education, that's CPE, and it's at least four units long, and four units is usually a year or more of residency. And that entails both residency in a particular setting, such as a hospital, a long-term care setting, a prison, psychiatric hospital, Sister Julia did her residency in a psych hospital, also children's hospitals. So there's many different places where we um, do our residencies. And maybe you are not aware, but Agnesian Healthcare is a residency site, and we will actually have a new student starting again in September, and they will stay with us for a year. They will do uh, 30 plus hours clinical, and then um, also classroom. And one thing that I just have to say about CPE, it just describes this the best in saying, it's like boot camp for chaplains. You walk in the door and think maybe you're going to get a manual and they're gonna teach us how to be one. But actually what happens is it's really a year long intense program where we learn about ourselves. What are our, our, our triggers? Because we all have them, we're human. There are things that are gonna trigger us there are things that are going to um, be biases that come out, and we have to discover that so that we do not bring that into the patient's room, to the people that we meet. So it's like learning uh, self-discovery and that self-awareness so that we do not inflict harm in any way to the people that we are ministering to. And also the next uh, part of the process is board certification. Um, and that's another uh, journey in and of itself and just a lot of writing. It's almost like doing a thesis all over again and then going in front of a board of interviewers um, and then finally the endorsement for board certification. And this happens through professional organizations such as APC, which is the Association of Professional Chaplains, NACC, which is the National Association of Catholic Chaplains, NAJC, which is the National Association of Jewish Chaplains. So there's many different, we come again in all different forms and shapes, religious backgrounds, um, and these are the endorsing bodies that uh, credential what we do. And much like some of the other fields, um, to stay board certified through these professional organizations requires continuing education. <coughs> and one thing that just, uh, said, no, make sure you say this, and so I have it nice and highlighted here, but just to give you an idea of what this process is, some of us have spent eight to 10 years in higher education and training to get to where we are today in a professional level. So that, you know, it's even kind of surprising to me. I, I don't know if I could do it again, but, <laughs> <laughs> but here we are. But also the other part of this piece is not all the heady stuff, what it takes, but also it's so much heart. That is so much a part of our ministry. I truly believe that chaplaincy is a call. Some, we come to this in various ways. You know, some of us get here by life experience. Some of us just know that this is what we're to do. For me, I had to go to the School of Hard Knocks first, and you know, this was a later in life kind of a, Thing, and I don't consider it a profession, I truly consider it a ministry. Um, it, there's the, in some ways it can be viewed as an art, the art of chaplaincy, because truly we are working with, our, up here the logic piece, but also <coughs> the art of conversation and the art of listening, because so much of what we do is meeting people where they are at, and then having to kind of sift through, it's a kind of a, a thing between the head and the heart. And we make room for the sacred and we make room for mystery. Chaplaincy then is a combination of head and heart working together and recognizing the nudging of the spirit along the way. So I hope that gives you a little better picture of, 
of what it is um, that we do, but we're going to show you um, a video clip here. Some of you may have seen it in, um, I, would it have been shown in one of the forums, I believe? It's the empathy video from the Cleveland Clinic. And what you'll see here is the lens in which chaplains view the world.
think that's a pretty powerful piece as we watch that and just think about what goes on. Of course, this is taken at the Cleveland Clinic, but these situations occur within Ignatian every day. And so we thought a way to bring this closer to us and to you is to share some personal stories from our ministry and to give you a look at a day in the life of a chaplain and some of the things that we encounter. This is one of my patients that um, was, I met when I first started into chaplaincy, and I have to say I carry this man's story with me. His, his story informs my ministry. Bernie, a middle-aged man with a wife and two children, was hospitalized on one of the medical floors, and he was going to ha be having a major surgery the following day. His nurse paged for a chaplain in the early morning hours and she stated that Bernie seemed very anxious, that he hadn't slept all night. He spent the night moving back and forth from his bed to the chair, and later on the nurses would see him roaming around the halls every chance that he could get. And when I entered Bernie's room, I found him sitting up in bed with his eyes wide open. He nervously invited me to sit down. And Bernie was a man of few words, really, but I could tell that there was something weighing heavy on his mind. And our conversation darted around from small talk to silence and admittedly moments of awkwardness. His eye contact was very poor. And during the time, I noticed that Bernie kept futzing with the edge of his blankets and he was taking the blankets and rolling them through his fingertips. And all of a sudden, Bernie blurted out, out of the middle of nowhere, I'm not really a religious kind of a guy. I don't go to church or anything, but I'm okay with God. And I thought, hmm, okay. And then he went on to explain in a very abbreviated short sentences that he didn't feel that he ever did anything so off the charts that it would prevent him from getting into heaven. So as snippets of sentences emerged from Bernie, it became apparent to me that Bernie was thinking that he wasn't going to make it through this surgery. However, I was really at a crossroad. You know, it probably would have been easier at four o'clock in the morning to become Bernie's cheerleader and to say positive things like, oh, nonsense, Bernie, you'll be fine. This is a routine surgery. You need to think positive thoughts. Or, Bernie, let's just take a moment here and we'll pray you into peacefulness. But you know what? That just wasn't what was going on. There was a nudge. There was something that said to me, you need to address the elephant in the room. So, you know, all of a sudden I just said to Bernie, okay, Bernie, what's going on here? What are you thinking about? What's bothering you? And he blurted out, I'm afraid I'm going to die. So rather than stay on the surface, Bernie and I embarked down the road of the what ifs. Okay, Bernie, so what if that happens? What if, you, if your biggest fear comes true? And with the elephant now acknowledged in the room, Bernie sat straight up in bed. He became more animated and he was able to make good eye contact. It wasn't so much that Bernie feared death as much as he had some unfinished business that needed tending to. There are things that my family needs to know. And he proceeded to tell me about a manila envelope that he had filed away that contained some very important papers that his wife needed to know about. And he also wished that he had told his wife how important she really was to him and how much he loves her. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And Bernie talked about his children and how he wished he would have spent more time with his daughter when she was a little girl. He said, I was so busy running around to baseball games with my son that I kind of forgot about her. But I would want her to know how proud I am of her and I would want her to know that she needs to finish college. So after our conversation, Bernie seemed like a huge weight had been lifted off of his, sh his shoulders. And I asked him, do you want me to contact your wife? And maybe this conversation can happen before you go to surgery. But he said, no, no, I don't want her to know that I'm even scared because that's just going to make matters worse. She's already worried. 
So we didn't, you know, it didn't go any farther but the two of, but between the two of us. And he did ask for prayer, and we prayed for a good outcome, and, you know, planned for the worst, but prayed for the best. And so I was happy and relieved to know that Bernie did make it through surgery. And he made it back to his room, and everything was going good, or so I thought. And about 24 hours later, I was here, it's a new day, and I'm in a different part of the hospital, and overhead, I heard the code, and it was called to Bernie's room. And after heroic efforts from the medical staff, um, Bernie did pass away. And it was, I just felt my heart sink to my stomach and think, oh my gosh, can this really be? And then I realized my role really changed at that moment because now here I am holding Bernie's story, Bernie's unfinished business, and I needed to get it to where it had to go. And that was such a revelation to me. And after the shock, after his family came in and the initial shock, we were able to meet and uh, have this conversation. Um, in that moment, I became the barrier, the bearer and the carrier of Bernie's sacred story and his unfinished business. And Bernie is a teacher for me because he taught me, I can see his face today like it was yesterday, and, and it was several years back. But it taught me a lot about um, not being afraid to embrace the story, to step into people's pain, but to let the story emerge. Like, we don't go in there with a checklist and say, are you afraid to die? Do you have unfinished business? Check, check, check. This all comes out in the art of conversation. So with that, I'd like to um, have just come up and tell you stories from her unique ministry. Thank you. <coughs> so one of the places that I step into on a monthly basis, several times a month, is the world of dialysis. Is anyone here familiar with that? I'm guessing quite a lot of you. So dialysis, if you're not familiar, and I was not before I began this, but it's the process of removing blood from the artery, as in a kidney patient, and then purifying it, adding vital substances, and returning it to a vein. So this is a lot like what one of the dialysis centers looks like. Uh, I work in Wapan, Fond du Lac, and Beaverdam, this is a little upscale, kind of nice, like the, the new Fond du Lac one, you should check it out. Um, but you have the TV monitors, you have places they can, you know, watch the cable or put their earbuds in and listen. This is where you'll find the patients. And it's a lot like there's this unwritten rule of assigned seating. Maybe if you go to church in the morning and if you dare sit in the third row where Aunt Millie sits, you're just not going to have a good day. It's similar to that. When you walk into the treatment floors, you pretty much know where Tom is gonna to be seated, seated next to Gordon, and then Ella's gonna be in the corner because she likes the corner. Okay, so these are the patient's chairs, and their stations are usually numbered. And in many ways, their days are numbered too. Because these patients are daily thinking about life and death. I mean, they vary in age, gender, religion, race, but they all have one huge thing in common. A machine is keeping them alive. This is pretty much what you will see if you're not one that can handle blood too well. You might not want to dip into this right when they're receiving the treatment, but usually they get a 15 or a 16 gauge needle put into their arm, or some of them are hooked up to a port, and this is where they spend a long time of their life. I have the privilege to journey with the dialysis patients in the ups and the downs that they face. And unlike acute settings where I might see a patient once or twice and never again, you start to develop a relationship with these people because they're there. And I joke with them when I leave, I know where to find you. No, yeah, you do. I'll see you again. And so often that's how this deeper relationship is built. Dialysis consumes people's lives as much as it takes three days a week, three to five hours a day, and that's where they are. Some patients have terrible cramping throughout this. Other people have the taste of metal in their mouth, so they can't really enjoy life sometimes. Um, people's fluid intakes are limited, so they're coming here with a lot on their mind. Um, some are younger, some are older, some are missing their child's baseball practices, soccer practices, their jobs no longer can be held because their bosses 
don't have patience for it anymore. So for this reason, no matter what walk of life they're at, there's a shared, felt, unexplainable bond that exists between these patients. Okay, it's what unites them. And I just want to share a few scenarios. One of them we're going to call Betty. She's been on the transplant waiting list for several months now. And actually, that's not a very long time compared to a lot of patients that are waiting two to three years. Um, but yet, last night, Betty's pager rang, and she got a kidney. So we all celebrate with her, right? Like, this is a huge answer to prayer. But today, as I look, we're all in the room together. Betty's chair is empty. And Don, who's two chairs over, is just looking a little bit off. So I pull up my chair, I talk to John, Don, and pretty soon I, I start to feel something's not right with him. And he starts to spill out this, this fear, this guilt, that even though he's happy for Betty, even though he's so proud that she got one, she, he's really jealous. Because what if he never gets a kidney? And it enters into this type of despair and this grief and this guilt that does take place at dialysis. And Don asked me to pray for him every single time. And every single month that I see him, there's updates about, oh, my granddaughter might be a kidney donor. Okay, that's really awesome. But the next month, we weren't a match. So if you can imagine, there's highs and lows and always this knowing that this isn't in their control. There's so many things that they do not have to look forward to the way that you and I do. But at the same time, there's so many joy, joys, shared joys and laughter. I mean, when a new baby is born, the iPad is passed around like crazy. I walk into the treatment room and someone says, you gotta check it out, Louie's got a new grandson. So I go to Louie's chair and he's beaming. I mean, it is so much like a family. But just like a family, you do lose members. And sometimes there also comes a point in dialysis where the costs of dialysis, the mental, the physical, start to outweigh the benefits. And that's where a whole new sort of pain starts to arise. If they're especially religious, they start to feel guilty, like, am I committing suicide if I want to stop dialysis? That's not a one answer question. And then they start to ask, I want to tell my daughter this, but I just don't know if I, I can't do it. She'd be devastated. So those are the conversations that lead to talking to the social worker, talking to the nurse, then we bring in the doctor, then we bring in the care team, and that's how this community continues to form. And those are just one eighteenth of the stories, the tip of the iceberg. But I just wanted to show you some of those highs and lows and the opportunity that I get to be in with them. Um, Dawn's going to highlight just a little bit here about her ministry in the behavioral health unit. Behavioral health ministry is a unique ministry and one that I feel very blessed to be a part of. And I see my colleagues over there from behavioral health and I do want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of your team as it is a truly a special ministry for me personally. So it's not uncommon for our behavioral health patients to feel that sense of hopelessness. Um, this is when things get so disconnected that um, spiritual distress manifests or shows itself in hopelessness, in feeling abandoned by God, in feeling abandoned by others, in isolation, in broken relationships, and there's a lot of shame and guilt, especially those suffering with addictions. Um, sometimes it's just so much a part of, that, of the illness, the shame and the guilt, and wanting to talk about um, forgiveness. So these are just this is really a lot of spiritual distress um, in this particular area. And now this is a dark, bleak picture, but sometimes that is where we meet people on the unit. Sometimes it is really, really heavy. Um, each week I lead a spiritual awareness group on inpatient behavioral health. And usually the group sizes are around 8 to 12 people. But one group in particular left a lasting impression. And the sense of the room when I walked in was very dark and dismal. 
One by one, people shuffled into the room, walking past me to sit in the circle of chairs. And as everyone got situated, I looked out into the group and saw a woman, fair-skinned woman, with rope marks from an attempted suicide. And about three chairs down from her is sitting a gentleman who attempted by cutting his wrist with a box cutter. And then a gentleman walked in the room and took his chair out of the circle and put it in the corner. And he's like, I'm just not feeling good, chaplain. I'm going to sit in the corner. And he had attempted with alcohol and Tylenol. And this is the reality. For those of you that are working in behavioral health, it, it's the reality. You know that we, this is what we work in every day. And you know, this lady in particular, she talked about, my life is meaningless. Right now, I'm just trying to do something positive in my life so that when I die, my kids have something good to remember me by. She was still actively suicidal. She was still planning on, okay, well, so when I die, you know, my kids need to have something positive here. So stories like this emerge. I'm alone. One gentleman in the group, that was his story. I am so alone and so cut off from family. I've made so many mistakes in my life that I'm really all alone. And one lady struggling with both addiction and bipolar, she said to me, I don't really even know myself without my drug. That's been my life. That has been my life. And now I'm alone. And those are really hard words to hear. And sometimes